My special guest this evening is Mike Barra. Mike Barra is a New York Times bestselling author, lecturer, and TV personality. He began his writing career after spending more than 25 years as an engineering consultant for major aerospace companies, where he was a card-carrying member of the military-industrial complex. A self-described born-again conspiracy theorist, Mike's first book, Dark Mission, The Secret History of NASA, co-authored with the venerable Richard C. Hoagland, was a New York Times bestseller in 2007. His second book, The Choice, which concerns hyperdimensional physics and how it relates to the Mayan calendar, Hopi prophecies, and the current 2012 era, was published in 2010. His 20, in 2012, Mike published Ancient Aliens on the Moon from Adventures Unlimited Press, a new in-depth study of artificial structures on the moon and the secrets it has held for millions of years. In 2013, Mike returns with Ancient Aliens on Mars, a new book from Adventures Unlimited Press, which will look at the hidden history of Mars and the vast ancient civilization which once flourished there. Mike has made numerous public appearances lecturing on the subjects of space, science, NASA, physics, and the link between science and spirit, and has been a featured guest on radio programs like Coast to Coast AM with George Norrie. He is a regular contributor to the History Channel programs, Ancient Aliens, and America's Book of Secrets, both of which are now showing on the H2 channel. Mike is starring in a new alien investigation reality show for Animal Planet called Aliens Uncovered. And we'll hear more about this this evening. That should air in December this year. And his website is... MikeBarra.blogspot.com. And please welcome Mike to the show this evening. Mike, how are you doing? Um, I'm a little buzz, Solaris, but I think we'll get through this just fine. <laughs> Great, all right. <laughs> uh, no, no, I was, just out, well, I was just out having some dinner and a couple of beers, watching a little bit of football on That's Saturday great. night. So oh, I have I'm here. So much. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. <laughs> it's great to have you here. You sound wonderful. So Thank you. For tonight. And congratulations. Yeah. On the television series, by the way. Yeah, that should be really exciting. That's something new that really hasn't had a complete formal announcement yet. We've just really had some small press releases from um, the Discovery people. It's actually it's a brand new show called uh, Uncovering Aliens. We all thought that it should be called Aliens Uncovered, but they didn't ask us. And uh, it's going to be de- debuting December 17th, Tuesday night at 10 o'clock. It looks like right now it's going to be a four-part series. And uh, I have some pretty cool co-stars. I have Daryl Sims, who is uh, the alien hunter and really does sp- spends a lot of time investigating abduction cases and removing implants and doing all kinds of cool things like that. And we have an- another gentleman named Stephen Jones, who is an Englishman that is an experiencer also. He's had many, many visitations and considers it to be a, a positive experience. And then there's Maureen Elsberry, who is a... UFO journalist, I guess you'd call her. She works for um, a magazine called Open Minds Magazine and does a little uh, Open Minds YouTube um, channel that nice. she does like once a week updates. And so the four of us went out and investigated a bunch of cases, and I can't tell you anything about those cases, but I can tell you this. I, here's what I will tell you. Uh, the network, by the way, is Animal Planet, uh, which is owned by Discovery Channel. So it will be on Animal Planet on Tuesday night, December 17th. That's the, the first episode. But I, I will tell you this. You know, Animal Planet has another show called Finding Bigfoot. And, you know, in that show, they never find Bigfoot. Okay? Mm-hmm. This UFO show is not going to be like that. We are and have found stuff. And it's going to be really, really interesting, I think, for the viewers. Oh, wonderful. Yeah, that's excellent. Looking forward to that. Me too. Perfect. Yeah, that's great. And, and I've been very intrigued with your research, by the way. I've been um, looking into your work, and I'm just amazed by some of the things you've been putting out, especially with the uh, your new book, Ancient Aliens on Mars. So I'd like to talk a little bit about that tonight, if that's good with you. And you okay with that? Oh, yeah, sure. I mean, okay. talk about my new book, no problem. Excellent. Yes. And um, I was going to ask you, insofar as, uh, well, if you'd like to elaborate insofar as why you believe, um, you know, insofar as the atmosphere on Mars, um, or what one would call habitable, with an advanced civilization. I mean, can you elaborate as to why you believe this, that it was once habitable and it had an atmosphere? Well, the the evidence that Mars once had an atmosphere is pretty much overwhelming. I think everybody agrees it was once warmer and wetter because you can see from sort of the fossil remnants of water flows and oceans that there, in fact, was a, a free-flowing, probably saltwater ocean in various parts of the planet. There were maybe a couple different oceans. Um, Richard Hoagland and I came up with a theory called the Mars Tidal Model back in, in early 2000, 2001. And the main thing that came out of that was that there were these dark stains that, that seemed like they looked like liquid or water running down the slopes of various hills and valleys and so forth on Mars. And when um, some people we were working with 
actually did a study and found the two, um, found where the locations were and actually mapped them. What they found was that these these stain images of these very dark streaks, which to me looked like water, and I was convinced it was water from the beginning, uh, clustered around two bulges on the planet, the Tharsis bulge and the Arabia bulge, which are actually diametrically opposed on the planet. They're, they're what they call at the antipodal position. They're 180 degrees around the circumference of the planet. And what Hoagland realized first, and we wrote a big long paper about, was that those were bulges caused by tidal forces. And what that means is that Mars at one time was in a tidal locked orbit around a much larger planet in exactly the same way that the moon is tidally locked to the Earth, in which case it's always showing the same face to the Earth. In other words, it rotates synchronously with the planet Earth so that it's always showing us the same face. And there, there's absolutely no disputing that. I mean, there is, there is no condition under which you could have two bulges 180 degrees apart around the planet one larger and one smaller that are not caused by tidal forces. That's absolutely every single body in the solar system, every moon that we see around Jupiter and Saturn has these bulges. Uh, the moon itself has the tidal bulges. The Earth even has the tidal bulges because the, the moon coinc- you know, is also tugging on the Earth. And what that means unequivocally without any dispute is that Mars was not is not a planet, but it was in fact a moon of this former planet which does not exist anymore. And that, that planet would have been in the orbit pretty much where Mars is today, although it would have been a more circular orbit. Where that leads you to is then you begin to look at these at the evidence of these catastrophic floods and you begin to look at the geological history of Mars, which according to the canonical belief system is that, you know, there's this heavily cratered southern hemisphere and this almost cue ball smooth northern hemisphere. And the thought is, is that the, the, the older, um, surface is the, the, um, cratered southern hemisphere is the older hemisphere. That's the ancient times because of the late heavy bombardment and the fact that there was all kinds of debris in the early formation of the solar system and that the, the upper part has been somehow stripped away or torn away from in some cataclysmic cataclysmic event and that's theoretically possible but what we came up with was something completely different which is that if these dark stains actually are water what that means is the water was forced down at like a 90 degree angle into the substrate into the the surface itself just below the surface and what you're seeing is these pockets of water that are bursting and spewing out on the Martian surface today that were actually once at the bottom of a vast Martian ocean that basically went from all the way around the circumference of the planet. And and that also explains Valles Marineris, which is this huge valley that is actually bigger than the United States is uh, across. In other words, it's longer than the entire continental United States. And that then is a tidal bore, uh, where you have an effect where the gravity of the planet, as it's being pulled around, tugged on by this parent planet, the water is sloshing back and forth and back and forth and just grinding out this huge, massive Grand Canyon type of formation between the two oceans. What that means then is, to add it all up, is that before something extremely devastating happened to the planet Mars, is that Mars was a, 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 a place where there was water, there was, you know, obviously it had to be at a temperature that was hospitable for there to be liquid flowing water. There almost certainly had to be life because, you know, in my belief system, there's life there right now. I think we discovered it back in, in 1976 on the Viking probes. And what it all translates to is that Mars was once warm, wet, hospitable, and habitable. And what happened was is that this massive planet that that Mars was orbiting, which was probably what they call a super Earth now, because we've discovered them orbiting other stars and other solar systems, somehow was destroyed or exploded. And so in fact what you have is that the northern hemisphere and the southern hemisphere are actually not one is not older than the other. They're from about the same time because what happened was is that when that tidal lock was broken by the explosion of this planet which the late Dr. Tom Van Flandern called Planet 5 or Planet V, when it exploded, 
Mars tipped over and the whole southern hemisphere was just spattered with all of the debris from this explosion and the oceans then broke away and flooded to the north and just basically scoured the whole northern hemisphere. So whatever civilization was there, and I think it was extensive and massive, was probably wiped out in a single day. And, mm. you know, that is, um, it's pretty sad. It's pretty catastrophic. But there's also evidence that the civilization then apparently afterwards moved underground because there's some stuff that, that implies that there's underground um, cities, for want of another word, uh, right there on on Mars. But that's kind of a long answer to a short question. Well, yeah, it's just mind-blowing to think about all of this information. And, and so much of this has like, been omitted insofar as what people are taught. Nobody has a clue insofar as the history of our solar system. So I find yeah. this information just incredible. I'm really, really appreciative that you're putting this out. So well, you know, it, it, in fact, NASA goes out of their way to actively suppress the idea that there was, that, for instance, it was long thought back in history that the asteroid belt was the remnants of an exploded planet. It was once thought to be called Phaeton. It was given a name. Um, planet V, or Maldek, as I like to call it, you know, was in another orbit. And if you look at Bode's Law, which is a, a to, to really simpli- oversimplify Bode's Law, basically it argues that each planet should be about twice as far from the previous planet as uh, from the sun as the previous planet. And when you look at that, what you can see is that there should be a planet right about where Mars is, and there should be a planet where the asteroid belt is. But there, what we have is instead is this moon, Mars, which used to be a planet, and then you have this massive asteroid belt, um, where apparently two planets, probably these large super-Earths, in other words, these super-Earths are terrestrial planets like the Earth with plate tectonics, and they're solid, rocky um, planets, but they're significantly larger. They're about five times as massive as the Earth. And, I mean, the implication of all of this is that planets can explode. And, and you know, you try, to, you try to put this out to NASA, and you try to submit a paper, and we actually did submit our tidal model paper, and they just said, oh, there's no evidence whatsoever to back up your conclusions, which is utterly ridiculous, because the fact that there are these bulges 180 degrees apart or in the antipodal positions on Mars is de facto absolute guaranteed rock-solid lead pipe cinch lock proof that Mars was once in orbit around a much more massive body, a planet. And that's indisputable, because every other object in the solar system that's in that situation has those bulges, and we know exactly how these tidal mechanisms work. So, I, I sorry, I know we have two hours. So I just didn't want to get, you know, I didn't, I didn't want to get too far off this because um, that is a really critical thing. They can, they can pretend all they want mm-hmm. that this is not the case, but we have the absolute facts, and the facts are that if you have those bulges in those positions, one large and one small, that means Mars was once in orbit around something much more massive. Mm-hmm. Do you think NASA's just deliberately covering this up, or do you think they're just plain, you know, illiterate or stupid? I mean, what's the trip? What's going on with them? They can't be that stupid mm-hmm. that they can't look at Mars and somebody 10, 15, 20 years ago didn't go, hmm, you know, these are bulges and they're at the antipodal positions, and pretty much obviously, you know what, that implies that Mars was in orbit around another planet. They just could not have missed that. So somebody would have figured it out before we did. And and that means that they're covering it up. And there's a lot of logical reasons why they would cover it up. The, the most likely one to me is that, you know, let's imagine the press conference where they come on and they say, well, you know, we've discovered the remnants of an ancient civilization on Mars. And we've also discovered that Mars, unlike, you know, what we pretend to you, that it was formed four billion years ago and there might have been life there, but it was all wiped out four billion years ago in the, in the late heavy bombardment. You know, that's where all these craters are from. If they instead say, you know, there was a planet that it orbited that it, that exploded, well, what's the first thing that's going to pop into your head? I know the first thing that pops into my head is, well, wait a minute, planets can explode? <laughs> you know, don't we live on a planet? I, I was not told there would be exploding planets. So that, that, would, that simple fact is so inherently destabilizing mm-hmm. to the, this desire to have everybody think of the universe and our own solar system as a, as a kind of a constant state situation that it's way too scary for them to even contemplate. So I think it's active suppression. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, that makes sense. And what do you think happened to the super Earths? I mean, what's, what's your theory on that? Well, what we know about the super Earths, or what we think we know at this point, even though we've been studying them from afar, is that even though they're much, they're much bigger, they are, they're more unstable. They're tectonically unstable. There's a lot of earthquakes that, there's a lot of implications from a rocky terrestrial planet of that size. The cores would have to, would have to be bigger. Um, and basically you'd have a big unstable planet, which could, under the wrong circumstances, simply blow up all on its own. Now, there's other possibilities too, which is when you look at the fact that there is this very advanced civilization on Mars, um, and life may have originated on Mars or it may have originated on the super Earth Maldek that it orbited. Either way, um, you know, the other possibility is that they didn't just blow up, but they were blown up, that there was some sort of conflict or war, because I don't, I'm not like a lot of people, I don't buy into this idea that you know, just because a, a, a civilization develops very advanced technology that somehow they're immune to all of the normal sorts of conflicts that, that human beings have. I just don't, I just don't buy that. I don't think it's a, a feasible, you know, it's kind of a, a Pollyanna Star Trek, the next generation kind of a view of, of the world. The technology will suddenly make everybody peaceful. I don't necessarily believe that. So, um, that's pure speculation on my part. But on, on the other hand, I, you know, who knows what caused this? But there are several, there are several natural mechanisms which were outlined by Dr. Tom Bat and Flandern in his book, Dark Matter, Missing Planets and New Comets, way back in the early 2000s. So, you know, there's definitely some scientific evidence of different ways the planets could just sort of blow their cork. Mm -hmm. That's pretty wild. What's, what's your take on the, uh, like, possible miniature black hole, perhaps, that moved through the solar system and maybe created some havoc? Does that make any sense to you at all or no? Yeah, it makes sense. I mean, you know, we, the thing is, we, I think we know so little about the universe. And what's, what's really funny is that, you know, there's this pretense that we know so much. I mean, I watch these stories on science channels, these, these shows, and, and they just act like we know this and we know that. And we know that there's this, such a thing called dark matter, which is, in my opinion, complete nonsense. And, um, you know, they, they sort of spell out all these things that we supposedly know, and it therefore follows that this must be the truth. And, um, you know, the fact is, is we know very, very little about uh, how things work. And I think it's any of these things are distinct possibilities. We just what we have to do is look at the evidence. And I'm you know, there's there's two kind of people, two kinds of people in the world. One are the authority figure driven people, the people who will not believe anything unless an anchor on CNN tells them, or a government authority tells them, or somebody that they consider to be an authority tells them. And there are other people that are simply driven by data. I'm driven by the data, and what the data tells me is that, you know, a lot of strange things and things that are cataclysmic happen on a fairly regular basis throughout this solar system and this galaxy and this universe all the time. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I agree with that too. That, did that, did that answer the question? <laughs> oh yeah, absolutely. Well, there, there's a lot of censorship for sure. I mean, I, I see a big smoke screen insofar as the data that's being relayed to the masses right now, especially when it comes down to NASA. I mean, you know, they airbrush all that, the photographs and this and that. But I'm um, just backtracking a little bit with the ancient aliens on the moon. I mean, can you elaborate a little bit on the artificial structures on the moon and, and why there is so much of a smoke screen regarding this? I mean, why, why not just tell the truth? Well, it goes back to a political document called the Brookings Report, which was actually, it was, it came out in the late 1950s. It was commissioned by NASA itself, right when NASA was formed by an act of Congress. And essentially what the study was supposed to do was it was supposed to look at the implications of what would happen if we explored the solar system. And embedded in that report, are a number of paragraphs which talk about the possibility of meeting up with aliens. And what it says is it's really unlikely that you will actually meet E.T. in your various, you know, um, searches throughout and, and, and explorations of the solar system. But what you might encounter, in fact, is artifacts or ruins or the leftovers of a previous highly advanced civilization that came through this particular neck of the woods. And if you do discover that, you should seriously think about not telling anybody because the possibilities for shocking us and driving us crazy and making us a little bit nuts are very high. And it even cites 
It's the 1938 Orson Welles War of the World broadcast as an example of what can happen when people are confronted with um, the fact that they're not, you know, we're not the top of the food chain necessarily. So basically that document was, in my opinion, political cover for NASA going out and studying, you know, landing on the moon, taking lots of images, studying the solar system, and not necessarily having to t- tell us anything because it, in a way they thought that they were doing us a favor by not telling us because society itself could, it, to use the exact word that the study used, the Brookings report said society itself could disintegrate if that information was put out without a proper conditioning period. So I think, frankly, we're still in the conditioning phase, and I don't think that they're ready to tell us yet. So that's why there's suppression, because there, there is some aspect of these, of, of these powers that be, there's some group of them that do sincerely believe that, you know, we'll all go crazy and we won't go to work the next day and society will collapse if they tell us the truth about this stuff. Mm. Seems like society's collapsing regardless of that. But yeah, you, well, you think about all the my Well, you vote, like, you know, you vote for Democrats. That's <laughs> what happens. But I say that out loud. Oh, sure. Go ahead, baby. Go ahead. <laughs> no, it's interesting. Um, it really is insofar as what's going on on this but I planet. Say that out loud. I'm sorry. No, you're, you're fine, Michael. Um, so insofar as the artificial structures go on the moon, I mean, are you familiar insofar as uh, what kind of species you might think? Created them, or can you can you elaborate at all? Or well, you look at the you, not so much the moon, but you look at Mars, and the thing that started this whole process was this this object called the face on Mars, which appears to be a human or a half human face sculpted um, into the surface of Mars in a, in a region called Sidonia, and that and the architecture itself, if you look at it, it, it implies to me that um, what you're looking at is essentially human engineering. I mean, when I, you know, I'm, I'm an aerospace engineer. I've got some experience with structural engineering. And when I look at it, I see things constructed and spaced and assembled the way a human civilization would do it, but a human civilization on steroids, one that was three, four, five hundred, maybe a thousand years more advanced than we are. So, it, that brings me back to what I talked about in my second book, The Choice, which is the Hopi prophecies, where they talk about the fact that there have been three previous, you know, worlds of man or human civilizations on this planet. And the last one, the third world of man, was actually far more advanced technologically than we even are today. So, you know, I'm not so sure that it's all alien. I think there's a distinct possibility that what we're looking at in, in, in some cases is in fact, um, our ancestors, our predecessors, the people that we're somehow genetically re- Michael? Mm-hmm. Okay, second. It sounded like you were breaking up there for a second. No, I agree with you on that insofar as uh, we are our ancestors, and, and that's very interesting that you made that comment about that. But I was wondering, um, insofar as just kind of going back and forth with the moon, do you believe it's an artificial satellite under intelligent control, which is capable of breaking Earth's orbit and moving independently? Uh, yeah, I won't go that far. Um, I think that one of the things that's really interesting about the moon, which is if we can believe the data that's been retrieved, and there, there's a few different... Michael, you're breaking up a little bit. You know, when ancient aliens on the moon, I talked about... All right, let's try again. <laughs> yeah, can you hear me? <laughs> yes, I can. All right, so where were we? We were talking about, um, let's see. Uh, we were talking about the origin of the moon and whether it was artificial. Correct. And... And to get the answer in real quickly, I would say no. No, um, it may have been modified to a great extent, but as far as I can tell at this point, it's not artificial. In, in ancient aliens on the moon, I looked into this, the various origin theories, and what what the current en vogue theory is is that this what they call the big whack theory, which is that some large Mars-sized body supposedly hit the planet, spewed off all this debris. And somehow that all coalesced and formed the current moon, and then it slowly spiraled outward into the current orbit that it's in today. And that basically was falsified. That was falsified about nine months ago to a year ago by a study that looked at the isotopic ratios of various um, moon soil samples and and the, the minerals and elements in them. And what it found was that at, as a matter of fact, the moon was made of exactly the same stuff as the Earth. Now, if there had been another body 
that had been involved with the formation of the moon, then its isotopic ratios, the oxygen isotopic ratios of, of the elements of that planet or object would have been different, and that would have been very, very clear, and, and it would not have, they, there would, in other words, there would have been a mixture of the two, and they would be different from those on the Earth. And, and since that's not the case, it's pretty much put the lie to the, the idea that this big whack theory actually makes sense. Mm -hmm. Now, um, you know, the the big whack as it stands is, as far as I'm concerned, is pretty much dead. And then what that means is that the moon was somehow fissioned off from the Earth, which brings us back to Dr. Tom Van Flanders' theories, which are the uh, the solar what he calls the solar fission theory of planetary formation and the exploded planet hypothesis. And the solar fission theory of planetary formation basically says that planets do not accrete as NASA says from the the uh, uh, you know uh, the nebula that that starts where the sun starts to sort of coalesce and collapse and spin and everything, then in fact what happens is is that the stars do form, but then they the stars actually eject planets out as large fireballs, and these planets eventually spiral out to stable orbits, and there's a whole mathematical pattern for that that fits Bode's law very very well, and then they cool and coalesce and become planets. And in within that theory is the notion that large gas giant planets like Jupiter will have multiple small moons and smaller rocky terrestrial worlds like the Earth will have only a single large moon. And in that context then, Venus should have a moon very similar to Earth and our moon. And you know, he actually um, put forth the idea that Mercury is in fact the former moon of Venus, but again, some cataclysmic event, probably the destruction of one of those planets we talked about earlier, somehow pushed Mar Mercury out of its orbit around Venus, spun Venus around the opposite direction because it spins uh, in the opposite direction of all the other planets, and, and, and basically broke that solar, that system up. But in that context, then, the moon would have been fissioned off from the primordial Earth. The Earth would have been spinning very, very, very fast. It would have flattened, obliterated, as they call it, and then spun the moon off, and the moon would have eventually spiraled out, cooled down, and become the moon that we see today. And that, to me, makes complete sense. It fits all the current data. None of the other theories, the accretion model, does not fit the current data. But beyond that, it looks to me in looking at images of the moon and things that I covered in ancient aliens on the moon, it sure looks to me like somebody came along afterwards and did some upgrades to the moon because there is a lot of stuff on there that is, I think, clearly artificial and definitely not, um, not stuff that would have just been formed by, you know, a natural a natural body. So I don't think it came from somewhere else. I think it came from the Earth, but I definitely think that there has been some refurbishing done to the mm -hmm. place. Let's put it that way. Yeah, that makes sense. And what about the the Black Space Program? What's your take on that so far as the structures go? Well, you know, you have all these opinions that there's a, a secret Black Space Program. I know people who have heard, who, who were friends as they were growing up with the different Apollo astronauts, who heard the astronauts talking openly about the secret space program, talking about the very advanced technology that they have, and I, they had at that time in the 60s, and you know, they, we're just spamming a can. They're sticking this up to, you know, they don't care whether we live or die. We're just the whole public uh, space program. Meanwhile, they've been to the moon. They've been to Mars over and over again. And they actually heard these types of complaints and heard the astronauts talking about this at pool parties and so forth. So, you know, I believe that person. I have no reason to doubt them. And I think that that is an indication that we have a secret space program. Now, in terms of what we see on the moon, is some of that stuff our bases? Quite probably yes. But uh, i got to be honest, mo most of what I see on the moon, in my opinion, is in ruins. It, it's destroyed. It's damaged. It's not uh, – same thing with Mars. It's not – currently active it's not habitable right now it's stuff that's been there for a very long time and been abandoned for a very long time hmm. interesting and so far as mars goes what, what about underground you said there were uh, did you say there were structures underground so is it possible they're living underground some kind of species well it's possible now that it's really interesting because in, in this is something 
stuff I'm going to have to get into in, in my next book, which is going to be Ancient Aliens on Mars 2, because right now Ancient Aliens on Mars just came out, but I didn't have time to go into this. But in the Sidonia region of Mars, where the face on Mars is and the very the massive pentagonal DNM pyramid is, what you see is you um, there were we were waiting when Mars Odyssey 2001 first went to Mars. We were waiting very anxiously for thermal infrared images of the Sidonia region, and we eventually got them. And there was a whole, you know, just absolutely fascinating political thing that went on where they released the images. Um, our infrared imaging specialist downloaded the raw data, and then the data was substituted with. Um, basically with faked data where you could not get the same results that we got out of them. But in the good data that they leaked to us, when it was processed and the processing was done properly, what you saw was just below the, what, what the objects that are called the fort, the fort and the city and the face on Mars and, and uh, the DNM pyramid, you, what you saw is that underneath that was this massive regular repeating cityscape there were buildings there were streets there were there were tunnels there were tube like transportation structures there were temples there were all kinds of objects that were clearly undeniably artificial and they would have been under the ground but the really interesting thing about that is that if the parameters of the camera are are correct in other words if the capabilities of the instrument the themis instrument are actually correct there there should have been some ground penetration of the surface of Mars, but not a whole lot. In other words, we should not have been able to see very, very deep below the surface. And this stuff definitely appeared to be deep below the surface. And so the theory became that what was actually there on Mars was that the, this whole city was kind of encased in in a sheet of ice or in a large glacier, which would have been all this water that, that scoured over the northern hemisphere and just filled up and sort of, you know, froze the city in ice maybe a couple million years ago. And even so, though, and looking at it even beyond that, that shouldn't even necessarily have been visible. So the only way that we could actually have seen all of these buildings and all of these structures, and they're just unmistakably artificial or unmistakably architecture when you look at them, um, and again, this will be in the next book, Ancient Aliens on Mars 2. Um, there's the only way you really could have seen all this stuff on these images, which we believe are genuine, would be if they were generating power. In other words, somebody left the lights on down there. It's it's literally like something out of the ancient, the old uh, 1950s science fiction movie, uh, Forbidden Planet. It's like the Krell civilization, you know, mm-hmm. the 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 people who built this, the machines are gone, but the machines are still there and they're still working. And and that's that's pretty incredible stuff. Oh so, yeah, that's you know mind blowing actually when you think about it. Um, there's a question for you from Steve Travesty, and he wants to know if there is an atmosphere on the moon. Well, technically yes, but it's it's like just a couple of molecules of gas per trillion you know, uh, of the volume of the moon itself. So technically there's an atmosphere, but in reality there is no atmosphere. It's a complete vacuum. If you stood out, you know, in the sunlight, you'd get cooked at about 250 degrees, and if you stepped into the shadows, you'd be, I don't know, 400 degrees below zero. So it's it's absolutely, it, it, and for all intents and purposes, it's, it's, a, it's a vacuum. It's a cold, hard vacuum with no atmosphere. But technically... They say it has an atmosphere. I think it's it's an atmosphere that's so insignificant that it's not even worth calling it an atmosphere, as far as I'm concerned. But hey, you know, I'm not the one who makes those rules up. So that's pretty wild. I'm still thinking about the machine world that you mentioned. That just blows me away. The pictures are online. You know, we we've got them up at the old Enterprise mission website that Richard Hoekland has. I can show you. I can point you right to them. Right. You can read the whole story right online. So what's the name of that website again? It's, enter, it's Richard Hoagland's website. is enterprisemission.com. Okay. So anybody wants to access that one? Yeah. Very good. Yeah. And, and what's your take in so far as the Anunnaki goes? Any connection to Mars? What's, what's your uh, theory on that? Yeah, I think so. And, again, this is something I'll get into, the, get into in the next book. We'll get a little bit more into the symbolism of it. But, you know, if you, if you look at this stuff, um, it makes sense. If the Anunnaki really existed, if they really 
came to Earth and they were involved here and they were doing genetic manipulation of the human race or any of the other species on the planet, you know, Mars would have been a logical way station on the way to Earth, not to mention that Mars itself could have contained minerals and things that they were interested in or needed for their their purposes. So I think there's a connection there, but what's really interesting to me is that there is a uh, there's a comic book that that we found from 1958. And in it, it was created by Jack Kirby, who is one of the very famous comic book pioneers of the 50s and 60s. I think he created the Fantastic Four and Silver Surfer and a bunch of those comic books, so those Marvel comic books. And he actually created a comic that was called The Face on Mars. <laughs> mm -hmm. And in this story, the first explorers go to Mars. They discover this giant face on Mars, which, of course, is exactly what we discovered when we went to Mars with the Viking probe in 1976 and mapped the entire planet. And in the story, this astronaut falls into, through the eyeball, he falls inside the face on Mars, and when he wakes up, he has this holographic vision of this civilization of giants who are exactly like the Anunnaki, and that they had this very advanced, peaceful civilization on the planet Mars, and then all of a sudden, these enemies who lived on a planet that orbited, guess what, right between Mars and Jupiter, where the asteroid belt is now, and they invaded Mars, and there was a war, and in the end, the only way that they could win the war was for these large, giant creatures to send a probe to the bad guy's planet and blow the planet up. But in the course of doing so, their entire civilization was wiped out, and they were forced to live underground so I look, I, and I, so I'm sitting here going this is exactly what we already thought without even you know without anything and, and you know there are there are some reports and I've been told today that this is not true but there it's it's up in the air but there are some reports that Jack Kirby knew people like Werner von Braun and Willie Lay who were involved with NASA quite obviously other people say that he was not um, in those kinds of circles I don't know if it's true or not but regardless he did end up working on the 2001 Space Odyssey comic book for Stanley Kubrick. Hmm. Stanley Kubrick has said that 2001 Space Odyssey was based on the Brookings report, which I talked about earlier, right. uh, cover-ups. Cover and, you know, it's possible, that he, it's almost as if you look at that comic book and I'm like, okay, this is part of the conditioning program that the Brookings report talked about, which is sort of telling the whole story without actually telling the story, doing it in a fictional way, quote-unquote fictional way, that gets the point across and starts mentally preparing us for the idea that this is a possibility. Right, yeah, they're calibrating the masses for sure with that. Scary stuff, weird stuff. Yeah, yeah. it's amazing. I'm getting that echo again. Strange, man. Okay, I, I just had a quick question in so far as the, I think we were talking, well, not with you, but about the radio transmissions from the 1920s um, pertaining to the face of Mars. Was um, Can you elaborate on that a little bit? I think that was Tesla that was in communication with, quote-unquote, extraterrestrials or some type of a radio signal. Yeah, no, it's interesting. That was not Tesla, although let's go back. This is in Ancient Aliens on Mars, and it's, it's, covered, it's in, covered in the first part of the book. And what you have is you have both Tesla and Marconi, who were, of course, the pioneers of, you know, radio and various wireless transmission of electricity. They were, they were physics experts. They were masters at this stuff. And they both claimed in the early 1900s that they had had communications that they were certain had come from Mars. So in the course of time, as time went on, uh, Marconi formed uh, several different companies. And the manager of one of his companies in 1922 gave a speech in New York City, which was covered by, I think, the New York Times, either the New York Times or the Washington Post, where he said, what we should do is we should try to communicate with any beings that might be living on Mars. And the way we should communicate with them is we should send out a series of dot and dash pulses, kind of like a Morse code, that would make up a picture of, as a, for instance, a tree. And then below that, we would send them pulses, which would spell out the word tree in the English language. And then we would send them a picture of a man, and then it would spell out the word man below that. And I think we should do this, and we should you know, definitely try. It's certainly worth trying to establish communications with any Martians that might be living on the planet. This is in 1922, and it, it, it occurred right before the 1922 Mars opposition. And oppositions are where Mars... It basically gets close to the Earth. It makes its closest approach on its given two-year orbit. And those really vary quite widely 
in terms of the distance, the actual distance between the Earth and Mars. In the case of 1922, they weren't all that close, but the next one coming up in 1924 was Pretty much it was the closest Mars opposition up until 2003. It was about 34 million miles, which is really, really close. So um, he, he made this proposal. That, and, and you know, again, this is a guy who worked for Marconi, made this proposal. And then in 1924, the Navy decides that when Mars makes its closest approach and is about 34 million miles away during opposition, that they want to have what they called a day of radio silence, where at the top of the hour for 10 or 15 minutes, every radio source, and there weren't that many back in the 1920s, would shut down, and all of the astronomers would listen for signals from Mars. And there was even a very special Navy-sponsored experiment where a balloon, a weather balloon, basically, would be you know raised up with an antenna that was designed to point directly at Mars and listen for signals. And another device was created, which was called the Jenkins radio camera. It was created by Dr. Jenkins. And what it was supposed to do is take any signals that it received, any sound it received, and print them out on a roll of paper. It looks like, you know, uh, an old Xerox copy, you know, back in the old days. Remember, now do you, are you old enough to remember when copy machines, they, they weren't on regular paper, they were on this sort of filmy, vellumy kind of paper. It was like a vellum paper. Yeah, so kind same, of kind, same kind of concept. Okay, same kind of concept. And it would basically translate whatever was received from Mars. Now, the interesting thing is, is that well, it, if the Navy had heard this speech, and it was a very well-covered, well-documented, well-known speech, and let's say, just for instance, that they decided to, in the night during the 1922 opposition, send such a signal out to Mars, as was suggested by Marconi and the manager of his company, then logically, the time to listen would be two years later, the next opposition, to see if the Martians replied. Well, apparently, the Martians did reply, because what came through was on this sheet that the Jenkins radio camera printed out, and this was a regular repeating signal, was a series of dots and dashes, along with what appeared to be a profile view of a humanoid I'm not going to say human, but a humanoid face. And this face repeated over and over and over again. And the dots and dashes repeated over and over and over again. And the astronomers, the people that were involved, Dr. Jenkins, some other people that were involved with that project, basically said, we don't have an explanation for this. You know, it, we're sure, we're almost entirely posi positive that it's not a local terrestrial signal it appears to have come from Mars, and this is what it printed out. In other words, the series of dots and dashes painted the picture. And the really weird thing, and I cover this in the book, and I, I again, I, I, I can't say that this is what it is, but when you look at this profile picture, when you, you take one and you crop one of these faces out and you flip it around, rotate it so it's straight up, it, you know what it looks like? It looks exactly like a profile view of Voldemort from the Harry Potter movies. <laughs> Oh no! Humanoid, he's got bald head, these brow ridges, this eye, and this flat, like, nose, and this mouth, and I <laughs> look at that, and I went, I've seen this somewhere before, this freaks me out, and I, I saw a picture of Ralph Fiennes as this Voldemort character, and I went, holy crap, it's, it's Voldemort. <laughs> but, now, I, you know, I don't know, it's, it, you know, look, who knows, it's entirely possible that somebody at, at, on the production of those Harry Potter films, you know, had had heard of the Jenkins radio camera, had seen this image before, and deliberately had the makeup made up to look like. I mean, you know, who knows? Who knows what the connection is? But it, or, or maybe there's no connection. But it was just really, really bizarre. And, and to me, as I looked at it, I'm like, this is intended to be a profile view of a face that looks not human, but humanoid. Mm -hmm. Definitely like it's related to us or something similar to us. And these guys at the time firmly believed it had come from Mars. And again, you have this constant ongoing theme with Mars, which is face, face, that there will be some sort of face, like letting us know that what we're supposed to look for is a face. And then, of course, when we get there in 1976 and fully map the planet, really for the first time in reasonably high resolution, what do we find but this massive humanoid face? It, to me, it's like, okay, I'm not a believer in coincidence, 
Exactly. And it's it's a bizarre story, but it's it's certainly um, it's one that I felt like had to be included in the mm-hmm. book. It's amazing, and, and so far as the um, the pinging back and forth, and so far as radio signals and transmissions goes, have they ever kept that going, or um, what, what's happening with that right now? Do they have a, a communication system set up? No, as far as I know, it's never been the experiment's never been repeated, hmm. and it's a it's a it's a shame because who knows. We might have heard from, you know, they might have been picking up signals from, again, if, if what we're looking at is this, this abandoned but automated civilization buried under the ice at Sidonia and other places on Mars, they might very well be sending signals out to the Earth. That might have been one of their last instructions, which is send a signal out, come get us, come rescue us, come find out what happened to us. You know, and a lot of, oh, if, a civilization was facing its destruction if it could not survive or was not certain of its survival or was not certain that it would survive in an advanced state, then it would, you know, it would seem like one way to let people know that, yes, we once did live here would be to leave a trail of breadcrumbs. And it's it's a pretty interesting trail of breadcrumbs, and it all seems to add up as I go through the book. It's pretty – to me, it's pretty interesting stuff. I, I don't – you know, I, I can't really say much more about it except – I think it's a really cool story, and that's why I put it in the book. Yeah, that's fascinating. I I strongly suggest people pick up your book, and that is on Amazon.com, correct? Amazon.com. You can also get it from Adventures Unlimited Press. You can go straight to my blog, and there's links right there. Um, But I'd rather you go through Amazon.com because it helps boost my sales numbers, and then when the sales numbers go up, Amazon starts promoting it more. So, awesome. You know, yeah. It's, so, yeah, right there on Amazon.com. And it should also be in your local bookstores. Um, I went to the bookstore the other day. They've still got, of course, Dark Mission is always there. Um, they've got they had copies at Barnes & Noble of the Choice. My second book, Ancient Aliens on the Moon, Ancient Aliens on Mars, is now in the store. So, you know, look awesome. for it in your local bookstore, too. Yeah, that's awesome. And yeah. Amazon Kindle, all the different, you know, e-book Great. sources, too. Cool. Yeah, I love it. And and so far as the communication goes, I mean, theoretically speaking, to establish communication with an off-world intelligence, wouldn't you say it would be based on on a radio signal or some type of a mathematical machine language? Yeah, it would be. And you know, radio signal maybe not so much because I think radio is a very archaic technology. But an emerging civilization that was just becoming technological mm-hmm. might still be using radio. That's why I think SETI is kind of a complete waste of time because. There are other technologies, hyperdimensional technologies, scalar scalar technologies, which have been demonstrated to work much better than radio, and I think that they would be used. It's kind of like the subspace radio of of the Star Trek TV show, but, you know, absolutely, it might actually be there. Excellent. Okay. Well, Michael, we're heading for a break real quick. We'll be right back. Raven Star's Witching Hour with Mike Barra. Stay tuned. Welcome back, everybody, to Raven Star's Witching Hour. I'm your host, Solaris Blue Raven, and I'm here with my special guest, Mike Barra. If you'd like to call in, the number is 347-688-2902 or Freedom Screen on Skype. And, Mike, I had a quick question for you. Um, we were talking about the uh, a possible communication system based on, on not radio signals but perhaps a scalar hyperdimensional communication system. I was wondering if you could elaborate on that. Um, I was afraid you were going to ask me that. Actually, you know, the real expert in that is is uh, David Wilcock. There's there's been some studies in in Russia, and this is really bizarre stuff, where they took basically organic material and put them into tin cans, separated by miles, like ten miles, and run current ran current through it, and were able to talk to each other. So I'm, um, you know, again, I'm not a super expert on. That and it's not something I've really written about, but it's definitely something that if you um, if you look at Dave Wilcox's material, you can you can read some of the, the papers on the Russian experiments. It was really bizarre stuff. Yeah, sounds really interesting. Bizarre. I'll have to talk yeah. to you off air about some things, but very okay. uh, yeah. Anyways, but there's another question for you from Steve Travesty. He goes, ask what he thinks of the Avenger Thor movies. Any comments? Um, I thought they were quite interesting. They're a little too politically correct for my taste, but um, you know, I, I well, you know, I mean. You know, I, and and really, Loki has been the bad guy in three movies now. We're gonna make him the bad guy in a fourth movie. <laughs> I mean, come on, really? But um, I've I've enjoyed them. I think that visually they're stunning. I, you know, I went and saw the last uh, Thor: The Dark World uh, film, and it has Cat Demings in it, which I really like. I think she's really cute. And uh, you know, they're they're okay films in terms of the symbolism and stuff. Um, 
you know, I think that, that these legends and myths are all kind of trying to tell us something about our true ancient history. And um, definitely one of the things that I thought was really cool about it was that when this alignment of the nine realms was supposed to happen, it opened up gateways and doorways. William Henry would call them stargates and stuff, where you can sort of move between the dimensions. And again, I think that's that stuff I've talked about in the choice, and, and they definitely talked about the fact that when we have planetary alignments, there's certainly experiments that show that our consciousness can be affected by these and that we can definitely have changes even in, in the laws of physics and how they operate. So to my mind, in that case, if it's helping to open people's minds to those ideas, then I'm, I'm all for them. And I thought they were very entertaining films. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. And what's your, um, what's your take on the military-industrial complex? Uh, what, what's your feedback on that? Any words? Well, I worked, at, I worked there for a long time, you know, mm-hmm. and I never saw anything even in when, when I had security clearances. I never saw anything that really was too particularly untoward, but, you know, maybe they realized I was kind of a conspiracy theorist and a big mouth and I wouldn't shut up, and so they didn't let me see anything. So, you know, I don't know. It it, it was really interesting. Um, I, I can't say that in my time in that that I really saw what these people imagined, that there's this dark plotting by defense contractors. You know, really, defense corporations take their lead from the politicians. The politicians are the ones who set the policies. They're the ones who set the ideas. They're the ones who hand out the contracts. And really all they're trying to do is fight for those contracts. So um, I think that when, you know, when people talk about the military industrial complex as if it is some sort of initiator of these plots and conspiracies and secrecies, there it's really not. In my opinion, it's the governments and it comes from government sources is where all this stuff originates. So I think we should look more at at the governments themselves and the people that are running the government agencies rather than the defense contractors because they they're really just trying to make a buck, you mm-hmm. know, and that's really what they're in in the game for. That's interesting. That's an interesting take on that. Yeah, there is a lot of um, you know, a lot of people associating the the military industrial complex with a lot of um, real devious agendas. So that's kind of interesting. As far as that goes, but um, as far as the, the Mars situation goes, do you think maybe there was a, a war between a different race or species that happened there, like a great battle of some kind? Yeah, I mean that's we're really deep into the speculation when it comes to that, but yeah. you know, because I really don't know. But yeah, I honestly think that that's that's the most likely scenario for what happened um, millions of years ago. And it's it's interesting because if you look at the orbit of Mars, it was actually there's a paper out now that says it was perfectly circular about 1.35 million years ago. So it's possible the destruction of the planet that it orbited, Maldek, only happened 1.35 million years ago, which would have been really, really recent times. And that, you know, would have wiped out the civilization that was on Mars. So it, it may be that we're, we've got a, you know, very young, it's, it's much sooner than a lot of people would place some of these cataclysmic events. So to me, that's very curious, but it, it's like, I, you know, I, I look at TV shows like Battlestar Galactica, where we build the machines, and the machines become too smart, and then they turn on their creators, and I look at the face on Mars comic, and the attackers appear to be machines, and I'm thinking, you know, is this some sort of racial memory? Is it something that we just know deep in our hearts or our minds that it, it's something that's familiar to us, so we recognize it, and we, we follow that pattern and are we you know we trying not to repeat that pattern now so to me it it, it's just i don't like to get into it because it's a secondary question to the Mm -hmm. to the bigger issue which is are there artificial structures on these planets to which my answer is yes but on the other hand you can't you really can't ignore it and what i would say is that you know yeah i think the the, the most likely scenario is that the planets did not just blow up they were blown up but i i cannot prove that and it's purely my my personal opinion and my speculation. Mm-hmm. Right. And I'm wondering, in so far as these um, these different types of uh, structures go, do you, do you get the feeling that perhaps they're also throughout our solar system and on different planets that we haven't really fully explored? Well, there. Are, the thing that's really interesting is that as you go through different images, you look at different objects um, in the asteroid belt. There's one object that's shaped like a diamond, which is a very bizarre kind of shape. There's an object, uh, an asteroid called Eros, which appears to have some sort of archway entrance <laughs> into it. There's, you know, Phobos is essentially the moon of Mars, the so-called moon of Mars is, is essentially 
a an asteroid, and it has this monolith thing, this this rectangular block sticking up straight up out of the surface of it. So, um, yeah, I think it's it's entirely possible that the deeper we get into the solar system, the more we're going to find that this third world of man or whoever built all this stuff, which could have been alien, could have not been related to us at all, um, that it, they really covered you know a lot. A lot of different real estate in the solar system at one time. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that makes sense to me too. And when I think of the universe, I me mean, for myself, I see it as some kind of a celestial advanced machine design, you know, driven by intelligent energy. I was wondering, what is your impression of the universe itself? The universe itself. Um, well, you know, I think when we talk about the universe, we're talking about an aspect of God, and and that's how I look at it. So we're talking about a creation, not just of God, but that's part of God. And, himself. Let's, let's use God the Father. Let's use that image for now. And I think of it as a living, conscious entity um, that is like a giant machine that has all these constantly moving parts. And what I wrote about in my second book, In the Choice, is the, the notion that time itself is really this physical, spiraling, torsional forward movement of everything in the universe and you know in physics they like to talk about when an object is at rest well the reality is nothing is ever at rest every you know you lay down to sleep at night you are not motionless you are not at rest you're still breathing the planet is still spinning the planet is moving in an orbit around the sun the solar system is orbiting around the center of the galaxy it's you know it's orbiting it's it's in an up and down wavy pattern as it travels through the um the galaxy the the galaxy is orbiting other galaxies everything's constantly in motion every atom in your body has an electron that is constantly spinning around it so you know i mean to me i think that there that everything is in sort of a constant motion and only when that forward motion stops is when everything would stop so i think the universe will go on forever as long as we keep moving forward. And I, I, to me, that's my philosophy of what life is about. You have to just keep moving forward. And as long as you're doing that in your personal life and that's in resonance with what the universe is doing, which is moving forward, then I think you'll, you'll be happy and fulfilled and, uh, you'll find yourself, you know, having the privilege of doing stuff like I get to do, which is talk to really, bright, intelligent, fun people like you on the radio and things like that. It's just a complete blast. Oh, cool. Thank you. And likewise, I'm really enjoying having you on tonight. Sorry we had a little bit of technical issues right earlier on. but um, And so far as the hyperdimensional, and maybe this isn't your area, but I have to keep probing you for it. Hyperdimensional physics. and hyperdim- No probing. Okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> that was the wrong no, term. Oh, yeah. There would be no probing. I was told there would be no probing. Oh, no. But hyperdimensional physics, I mean, can you elaborate on that? Well, basically, this comes from the mathematical alignments involved with the so-called monuments of Mars. Way back in the early uh, 1980s, when the face on Mars and the what's called the city area at Sidonia and the cliff and the Tholus and the d and pyramid, and all these objects were first identified, uh, a man named Errol Torin, who was a cartographer, map maker, and, and um, a satellite photo, an analyst for the Defense Mapping Agency, came in and looked at all this stuff and said, not only are all of these objects artificial, but they have a a specific internal mathematics to each of their forms, and there is a relational mathematics to these forms. And what that what spilled out of all of that was basically a mathematical pattern that seemed to say, look at the tetrahedron, which is the simplest of the five platonic solids. It's basically a four-sided pyramid, usually with, um, you know, equal sides. Basically take four equilateral triangles, fold them over, you have a tetrahedron. And what that seemed to say was that this object, the tetrahedral pyramid, is the basic physical building block of everything in this three-dimensional universe. And from that, if you take it and put it inside of a sphere and that sphere is spinning, what you'll find is, well, not, it doesn't have to be spinning, but spheres, usually planets, for instance, are spheres and they're spinning, that if you were to um, actually have a tetrahedron inside of these 
of the planets, for instance, at about 19 and a half degrees, the infamous 19.5 degrees that Hoagie's always talking about, you would have this um, upwelling of energy, which would actually be energy that was coming through the planet and from a higher spatial dimension, the fourth, fifth, sixth, all the way up to the 26 different dimension, 26 spatial dimension. And um, that was the basic theory that, that he concluded and that, that Mr. Torin concluded that the Martian architect, whoever built these monuments, was trying to convey to us. He was trying to say to us, the universe is not just this crude, three-dimensional, limited perception that you have. It's actually a hyperdimensional universe which is with many, many layers above you. And if you take something and spin it, you can actually gate or pull this energy down from higher dimensions. And, and it, you know, it's, it's kind of complicated mathematics, but the bottom line is, is that any information coming through from a higher spatial dimension is going to be turned into energy in 3D. And what that implied, since everything in the universe is spinning, is that what powers the universe is energy from above, energy from somewhere else. And everything that is energy, for instance, radio waves are energy, electromagnetic energy. Your thoughts are all electromagnetic energy. And so it has really deep, profound implications for the probability that our consciousness is actually not necessarily physically embedded in these physical bodies, but actually is connected to some higher being or higher self that exists in another aspect of the universe that we really can't perceive in 3D. So that's the basic concept of hyperdimensional physics, and all you have to do to get that energy is spin stuff. Mm -hmm. And there's lots of experiments, lots of examples. I cover this a lot in The Choice. I covered a little bit in Ancient Aliens on the Moon. I've covered it a bit more in Ancient Aliens on Mars. And basically, it's kind of the secret everything, because the amount of energy is unlimited. And, and where this conflicts with modern physics is that modern physics assumes that the universe is a, quote, closed system, end quote, meaning that all the energy that's in this universe was present at the creation of the universe, and there can never be any more. And what hyperdimensional physics says is there's unlimited amounts of energy out there. All you have to do is ac to access that is to spin stuff. Spin planets, spin, you know, spin devices, spin magnetic fields, spin the upper stage boosters on uh, on rockets, and you will get more energy into the system than you actually than you should. You will you will negate the effects of inertia and effectively create kind of an anti gravity effect. So, mm -hmm. you know, th this is the concept, and and the thing is, is that nobody would have thought of any of this stuff or connected these dots, connected the original work of, of James Clerk Maxwell and, and some of the topologists like uh, HSM Coxeter. Nobody would have connected all this stuff if it wasn't for these images of these apparent artificial structures on the surface of Mars and their relationships to each other. So whoever built these, I believe that their intent was to gift us with this knowledge that we are not these isolated blocked off three-dimensional creatures with no connection to anything higher that we are in fact always in touch always connected with something beyond ourselves who we really are the people we really were and really hope to be against someday yeah i totally agree with that totally 100 percent. and i have a question for you here from mark eddy he's asking did these tetrahedrons and geometric shapes get brought to the earth to design the pyramids in egypt or central america well, no, the Egyptian pyramids are not tetrahedral. It's really interesting. That's a, that's a five-sided pyramid because it has four um, square, si you know, four triangular sides. Sorry, and then a square bottom. So that's a five-sided pyramid. So there really aren't very many tetrahedral pyramids on the Earth. In fact, if there are at all, which is really kind of interesting, but they're all, all over the place on Mars, especially in Sidonia. There's many examples that I put in the book of small objects, objects, well, small. They're about the size of the Great Pyramid at Giza, but they're small by comparison to some of the other objects on Mars. And they uh, tend to be tetrahed tetrahedral. And also, these are what are called these different mounds at Sidonia. And as you enhance and look at the images of these mounds, well, they're shaped like tetrahedral. So not only is there a tetrahedral mathematics to their arrangement, they look like tetrahedral pyramids. So I don't know if there's a connection. And I don't know if that means, if that's, necessarily, um, 
it's because of the fact that that they're they were not you know things weren't supposed to be too easy for us here on earth or what but the reality is no there's not a lot of stuff on earth that appears to point to this tetrahedral geometry it all comes from and it's it's connection to physics it all comes from the monuments of mars so it's it, it's as if it was meant to be secret until this period in time when we could understand it Hmm, that's fascinating. And there is that connection between Mars and Egypt. So um, what, do you, what do you think that connection really is about as far as the pyramids over there in Egypt versus uh, Mars? Is there any, any real transmitter or connection between those two areas, well, you think? There's definitely some connection in, in, the, in the sense that Mars was, you know, observed by the Egyptians. It was definitely part of their mythology that the, you know, the, uh, the Sphinx at one time was called Hordeshur, and was painted red and was a, a considered to be, um, uh, you know, connected to Mars. So Mars was always on the minds of the ancient Egyptians. Uh, I think it's possible that, that the Anunnaki, you know, when they came to Earth, came from Mars initially. There may have been some connection to their gods back then. And and then there's weird stuff. I mean, there's this, um, I, I devote a chapter to the, the Mars Pathfinder landing site, and there's all these mechanical boxes and instruments and things that are in the in the, the so-called rock field around the landing site. And then off in the distance, there's these two hills that they call the Twin Peaks, which both appear to be pyramids. They're not tetrahedral pyramids, but they're pyramidally shaped. They've been damaged in some sort of catastrophic flood that came through the area, but at the base... Right between the two pyramids, in the far distance of several of the panoramas, is what looks like a sphinx. I mean, to me, it's like, okay, this looks like a sphinx with maybe some some enclosure or temple structure behind it facing the camera, you know, on its paws facing the camera. And its resemblance to the sphinx in, at Giza was quite extraordinary. But I was really disappointed when I got to the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter images of Right where I thought I, I, right where I thought the Sphinx would be, because there's a big argument. The debate is: were these small rocks close to the lander, or were they big structures about the size of the Great Sphinx itself, far, far away from the lander? And you know, uh, when we first got the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter images of the area, the very first uh, context images, there was a there was a sort of a dark patch, right centered right between the two pyramids, right where this Sphinx object appeared in the uh, in the panorama. And I thought, wow, this this could be it. I mean I really could have some some proof here. But when we got the actual MRO images and zoomed up on it, it was just a trench. There was just nothing there. It was just this and the interesting thing is is that within the trench there was very little data. In other words, it, it was as if somebody had taken a, a blur tool or something and just sort of wiped out whatever was there. So um, whether that image was altered or not, I don't know. I have tons of evidence of tons of images of both Mars and the Moon that have been altered digitally by NASA, so that's definitely something they do. Mm -hmm. But I don't know. I mean, there's no answer. There's certainly, in looking at the MRO image, there certainly is nothing in it that, that could be the Sphinx. In other words, if you look around where the actual Pathfinder lander is on the image, and you can see it from orbit, which is unbelievable. It's how good the camera is. Mm -hmm. um, there's nothing that could have been the Sphinx rocks if they were closer to the lander. There's nothing. The only thing that could have been would be these this distant object, but it appears to be just nothing. So there's lots of interesting connections. There is um, Carl Sagan's Pyramids of Elysium, which he first brought to people's attention way back in like 1980 in his television series Cosmos. Mm -hmm. And as you look around at some different Elysium pyramids, they are definitely shaped almost exactly like the Egyptian Great Pyramids or very similar to uh, pyramids that have been found in China, and I make that comparison in the book. Mm -hmm. And for all intents and purposes, they're identical to those. But for some reason, on on Earth, when you find a pyramid in isolation, in other words, it's not part of a mountain chain, it's pretty much automatic that it's artificial. And you go and you dig it up, and sure enough, it's been constructed, it's built of stone or whatever. But when you find the exact same thing on Mars, it can't possibly be artificial. You know, everybody's like, "Oh, you're you're crazy." Well, why are, why not? Why why wouldn't there be? You know, and and again, visually they're an exact match. The only real difference is scale. But but again, everything that we see on Mars, which appears to be part of the civilization, is is on a massive scale. So that's not surprising to me. 
Mm. It's really fascinating. You know, when I think about this planet itself, this our planet, I'm wondering if we are not transmitting some kind of machine language off to other other planets. Um, what's, what's your take on that? Do you think it's possible that we have our own archives of, of data and maybe an artificial type of uh, communication system that has been transmitting without our, our knowing? Our well, I, you know, we have communication system. It's called television and radio, and we're sending all sorts of idiots right. out there, like right. like married with children on a regular basis. Mm. Although they're also getting the Playboy Channel, which they may or may not appreciate. But uh, you know, yeah, we're constantly transmitting, and you know, all the chatter of our cell phones and everything's always constantly going out. So, you know, I I don't know. Um, that would be pure speculation, and that's that's even deeper than I can go into. I don't know of anything like that. Haven't heard of anything like that, and. You know, I think you, it, if in fact the two planets, the two super Earths, Maldek and Phaeton, that were, that were blown up or blew up in the solar system perhaps millions of years ago were in fact blown up because of a war, maybe we shouldn't really be broadcasting our presence to everybody in the, in the local neighborhood. Maybe that's not such a great idea. So, you know, to my mind, um, it's kind of like the film Contact, you know, it could, right. it, it right. could be a good thing. Or it could be a bad thing because we don't really know whether the guys that are hearing the signals are good guys or bad guys. And I think that probably aliens are not too different than humans. There's probably really nice aliens and really, I don't know, cranky ones we don't really want to get involved with. Mm-hmm. That makes sense. Well, we certainly have some strange units on the planet in human form. So I noticed I was getting a little feedback over here, but um, I'm not sure if anything was open on your end over there on your computer. But so far as some of these um, ancient races go, where do, where do you think they went? Um, do you think they went extinct, or do you think they kind of phase shifted or bilocated someplace else? Well, um, I think, you know, it, again, this is really deep back in history, and it's not it's not entirely what I'm focused on, but the reality is... It is questions that you get asked and it's something that you have to, you have to kind of sort through for yourself and, and decide what you think about it at some point. And what I tend to think is that at some point after the cataclysm, that they attempted to live underground for a long time, um, whoever they were, and let's, let's assume the face on Mars comic was real and they were, they were Anunnaki types. And eventually they had to leave Mars because it just wasn't livable anymore and they came here. And when they came here, I think that it's pretty clear that, you know, the biblical stories of Genesis are basically correct, you know, that I shall make man in my own image. Or you can take the Sitchin interpretation, uh, the he- original Hebrew translation, which is we shall make man in our own image, the, the sort of royal plural, but it's definitely implies that there is not just one god, but many gods. And I think what they did was they spliced their DNA in with uh, Neanderthal DNA and created modern man. So I think that that's where our physical bodies came from. Of course, physical bodies are just, you know, that's just a container for a soul. It's not really, um, you know, to me, it's like, it's not important. That's not a lot of times Christians get themselves caught up in this whole debate over whether God created man. And really, it's the, a body is just sort of a container for this higher spirit that mm-hmm. is, you know, where all the consciousness really comes from. So right. to me, it's not that not that big a deal. But that's that's basically my take on it is that, yeah, they came here, they crossbred us with them. That's why we have so many genetic diseases. Mm-hmm. I think a lot of Sitchins work in this case on this stuff is is really accurate and I, I really do support a lot of his conclusions. So mm-hmm. you know, so you've got the fact that the mitochondrial DNA of the human species only goes back two hundred and fifty thousand years. And that implies that at that point two hundred and thirty nine thousand, whatever the exact number is, but it, it implies very clearly that at that point some sort of intervention happened in human genetics. Mm-hmm. Most definitely. And it seems like they're still trying to do that here on this planet insofar as um, genetically modified foods and this and that. And don't get me started on that. But it seems like there's a little bit of modification insofar as trying to alter the DNA even today from what I've seen. But I don't know what your take is on transhumanism. Are you familiar with that at all? Not really. Okay. I was just wondering if you had heard about the transhumanism agenda or if you're even familiar with the. It's basically no. man integrating in with machine. and, and the, Oh, yeah. Yeah. Just wondering, it seems like. Well, I know for a fact, I know for a fact this is already, this work has already been, um, 
it's been done. It's been done. They've been working on this for 20 or 30 years, which is actually taking biological cells, human brain cells and connecting them to computers. And, um, it's chilling. It's frightening. Did you not watch Battlestar Galactica? You know, I mean, it, it's, it's not going to turn out well for the human race. Did you not watch Terminator? Okay. It's not going to turn out well for us. So, you know, but I know these experiments are taking place and very high levels with very advanced, um, sophisticated, you know, um, technologies and people are being, there's definitely resources being committed to this. And it's, to my mind, it's very scary and it's not a desirable thing Mm -hmm. at all. Um, I want my, I want my devices to be at my service. I do not want them to be part of me. And uh, I think that's a real dangerous path to go down. And it, it might very well be the path that our predecessors on Mars took. And look what happened to them. Right. Yeah. Highly possible, without a doubt. Yeah. What's your What's your take on uh, Atlantis, just out of curiosity? Well, I think Atlantis is a metaphor for this, you know, highly advanced previous civilization. The Hopi's called it the third world of man. You know, Sitchin calls it the Anunnaki. I think it has to do with a very advanced humanoid civilization that I think flourished throughout the solar system hundreds of thousands, if not millions of years ago. So I think Atlantis, in terms of its, its, um, like its social interpretation is it's, it's simply to my mind connecting to all of that stuff. It's the mythology is simply a reflection of that very advanced civilization that we know exists. The idea that there was definitely a continent that sank below the ocean that can be found necessarily, that I'm not so sure of. But, you know, the the idea of Atlantis, the concept of Atlantis, I think is valid. The the physical location of it is debatable, but I think we found evidence really all over the planet mm-hmm. of advanced civilizations that are, you know, it, below the water in areas where they would have been, you know, what they would have existed, it would have been, it's been 10,000 years 12,000 years, much older than human civilization is thought to be, mm-hmm. where these advanced civilizations existed. So I don't think there's any question that some sort of Atlantis or Atlantean civilization, antediluvian civilization, did exist. Whether it was Atlantis, Lemuria, whatever you want to call it, is, is a, so that's, that's, that's up for debate. I'm not really sure. Right. I think what amazes me the most is, is to have such an advanced race go in reverse. It seems like it's, for whatever reason, it seems like they all went in reverse and so far as technology and even their evolution. Who knows? But they just kind of phased out. So I find that very interesting. Um, well, you know, there's two possibilities for that. One is that whatever devastated Mars could also have devastated the Earth and basically blasted us back into the Stone Age. I mean, the, the different craters that we found, the, the certainly the, the KT event, those kinds of impacts on the Earth could have really devastated a civilization that was here. So that's one possibility. The other possibility, which is really interesting, was, was something I covered in The Choice in my second book, which is brought up by the uh, the Vedic texts. And what they talk about is that when we are in alignment with what they call Vishnu's navel, or the source of enlightenment and light and and knowledge and energy, it's it, it's an it's an object that, that according to uh, Sri Yukteswar, who was who wrote, um, well, what was it? The Holy is a book called the um, uh, the Holy Science, and he talks about that there is this celestial object that the Earth orbits around, and when there is a lot of uh, obscuring energies or darkness or clouds between us and Vishnu's navel, that we go into a period of darkness where knowledge is lost and our intuitive powers are lost and our ability to do things becomes cruder and cruder and we basically go into kind of a dark age. And when we get clear of that darkness and clear of that cloud and clear of that obfuscation, that we then again begin to become smarter and smarter and not necessarily smarter in our minds, but smarter in our hearts, more you know, more attuned to our hearts, more intuitive, more spiritually powerful. And then that we go back into a bronze age and a silver age and eventually a golden age. So if if that is actually the case and there is this sort of cyclical relationship with the source energy, wherever it is, and I don't know if Vishnu's navel really exists or not, but um if that's really the case, then it actually makes a certain kind of sense that we would go through these cycles where we get smarter and more spiritually advanced and then dumber and 
dumber and less spiritually and technologically advanced. So we go up and we go down and we go up and we go down in a, in a cycle, much in the same way that the solar system, as it orbits the center of the galaxy, goes in a wave pattern above and below the plane of the ecliptic, mm-hmm. you know, over and over again in these very long cycles. Right. That makes perfect sense to me. And it seems like without spiritual evolution, technology is worthless, really. Well, or the thing is you end up worshiping the technology. And, mm-hmm. you know, I mean, the thing is so many people folk are focused on what they know intellectually now. It's like you have to, you know, there's all these supposed rigors of science, which, of course, the people in science don't actually ever follow. And when they apply it to anything paranormal, they never follow the same rules that they claim to apply to everything else. But there's all this stuff. It's all based about knowing something in your mind. And there was a time thousands of years ago where what we knew in our hearts was just as valid as what we knew in our minds. And I think our intuitive powers were just as well respected. Mm -hmm. That has been lost, and it's possible it's been lost because we're in a period where our intuitive powers are less significant, less powerful, less tuned up, Mm -hmm. um, and we just don't take them as seriously as we used to. So we've gone into sort of an, uh, an intellectual dead end is what we've really kind of reached. And now we have to reach back to that spiritual aspect of ourselves for enlightenment. I don't think you can have enlightenment without both. You have to have the knowledge that you can put your fingers on and measure and know in your mind, and that knowledge has to be matched up with the knowledge that you know in your heart as well. And Mm -hmm. that's something I think that we've lost. And, you know, science, when you get to the fringe of science, when you get to the end of the Big Bang Theory and all this stuff that the physicists talk about, ultimately you realize it's no different than philosophy. In fact, a lot of it just is philosophy because there are so many things in science, in cosmology, that are actually just taken on faith. They're not things that are really proved. They're things that they tell you are proved, but they're not really proven. So, yeah. That's it's, so it's, true. It, that's that's the direction we're ultimately headed. Mm-hmm. And it also seems like there's a lot of interference being run. I mean, everybody's conditioned for their little devices and cell phones and and everything mm-hmm. else, which is great on some level. But at the same time, it's there's a there's kind of like a disconnect between spirituality and their own sensitivity, and then the man-made technology. From what I've seen. Yeah, the the way to connect with people now is through social networks on mm-hmm. the internet, and you don't have as much of a connection to the people you live right around or that are necessarily part of your community, and that's an interesting um, change in our culture. And it and it's it's a good thing in some ways, but it's a bad thing in other ways. Mm-hmm. There's no there's no question about it. Yeah, I see that too. And and so far as Mars goes, um, as it stands right now, would you say it's uh well, obviously, we could terraform it, right? Or is it mm-hmm. able to sustain some kind of life now as it is? Well, you know, in 1976, the Viking landers were um, sent to Mars. There was two of them, and they were designed to test for life, and they both came back in an experiment called the Label Re- Labeled Release Experiment. They both came back positive for microbial life. There were several other experiments, I think three other experiments, that were also on each of the two landers, and they did not register the things that they were looking for to register actual proof of microbial life. But it now turns out, 20 or 30 years down the road, that it turns out that they, those instruments, did not have the sensitivity required to have actually detected life had it existed. Only the label release experiment was sensitive enough, and it did detect microbial life. So I think there's no question in my mind that that bacteria, microbes, do live, exist right now on the surface of Mars. And, yeah, you're absolutely right. We could terraform Mars. In fact, I think we should start the project immediately. I think we should be sending, you know, um, plants, simple plants and lichens to the planet. And basically what you would do is just is just bombard the planet with these plants that would feed off the carbon dioxide, which is what so much of the atmosphere is, and give off oxygen. And over time, you would build up rebuild the the atmosphere to the point that you would have a livable, breathable atmosphere. Mars would still be kind of cold, but it would be habitable. And, you know, I think that that's something that we should definitely look into doing. I think it's a worthwhile project. And um, certainly there's nothing on Mars right now that's advanced enough that we have to really be too concerned about. Nothing about detectable, right? Yeah, really. It's like, there's not really much there. So. Good, until the robots come back. Well, until the robots come out, yeah. <laughs> uh, that's, the, that's the problem. But, I mean, what, what I'm saying is there's no apparent life forms that would be harmed mm-hmm. by a change in the climate. And in actuality, you know, 
nature is very adaptable, and I see no reason why they couldn't adapt to the new environment. And, you know, I think for the sake of our own survival long term, that it's a worthwhile project for humankind to start trying to terraform the planet. And I think we should be starting to send truckloads of uh, plants to Mars today. If I was president, that's one of the things we'd be spending some money on right now. You know, right. we'd probably generate a few more jobs than uh, some of the things we've been trying lately. Yeah, no kidding. We, we need to nominate you then, get you in there. Uh, that's fine. <laughs> That's that's very true. What what's your take on the Earth itself? I mean, I think we're in bad shape insofar as the planet itself goes. What, what's your impression of what's happening with this world? No, I don't agree with that. I you, you know I you know, I'm very optimistic, and I I you know look I, 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 everything that the environmentalists have claimed in my lifetime has turned out to be false. Back in the 1970s, we were ahead of the new ice age because things were very cold. Then we started warming up, and then it was global warming. Then there was ozone depletion. Remember ozone depletion? People were going to be dying of cancer by now. They didn't die of cancer. You know, Ted Danson, that brilliant oceanographer Ted Danson, declared in 1988 that within 10 years, the oceans would be dead at the rate things were be species were becoming extinct. Well, here we are 30 years later almost, and you know, the oceans are not extinct. We're still getting plenty of fish out of the ocean. So, no, I don't believe that. And I don't, I don't believe that human technology, human activity is damaging the environment. I just don't think there's any evidence of that. I mean, there was a time when it was probably not a great idea to be dumping our garbage and chemicals into the rivers and the, um, and burning off our garbage with no filters on it, but we seem to have cleaned all that stuff up. I mean, when was the last time you heard about a smog alert in an American city? We really don't have them anymore. They still got a problem in China, but mm -hmm. you know, everything seems to be getting better. And I, I just, I just don't agree with that. I think the planet is very resilient. It's very strong. Mm -hmm. uh, we're doing a lot more to make things easier on her. And I, as far as I'm concerned, I think the future is very, very bright, and I think the planet can sustain a much higher population than it has right now, although I certainly would like to see the growth slow down a little bit. But, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, I'm, I'm not a pessimist. I'm very optimistic, and I think our ability to to come up with new solutions to any problems that we might have is is pretty much unlimited. We're very bright, and we seem to do things. And, we, and more importantly than that, in the end, we always seem to do the right thing. So, mm -hmm. you know, I'm... I'm an optimist about good. it. Good. That's good news because I what hear a lot the opposite. <laughs> yeah. Well, you're not an Aquarian. You know, well, you know, Aquarians, you know, Hitler was an Aquarian, right? So, you know, we, you know, love, love humanity, hate people. That's, that's what Aquarians are. I thought Hitler was a, <laughs> I was he a Taurus? I don't know. He might have been. I don't know. Somebody told me that once. You know, Hitler was an Aquarian. I'm like, really? He goes, yeah, just like you. Love humanity, hates people. Uh, uh, do you hate people? Not, no, I don't. Some, just some people, but no, in general. No, but I, I really, I really do believe that we're, we're conquering both these problems. And it, you know, it turns out there's no, really no such thing as global warming. We've been cooling now for 15 years, and it's all connected to sun cycles. And, gee, what a shock. You know, the, the, the big thing, the big glowing orb out there that provides all the heat, the, the more energy it puts out, the hotter things get, and the less energy it puts out, the cooler things get. Jeez, who would have thought that? And and so is there really a need for carbon taxes and all this other stuff? Well, no, there isn't because carbon dioxide content of the atmosphere keeps going up, but the planet keeps getting cooler, which is exactly the opposite of what the so-called climate models show us. And I think that proves to us that they're politically motivated. They're not – they're you know, most of these climate models are politically motivated. I think that the, the whole global warming scam was a great cash cow for – you know, the, the science industry in general, and um, I'd like to see us move on from that and take a more realistic approach to uh, to our real problems, which is how to how to get everybody fed and how to get everybody clothed. And, uh, you know, that's more important to me than than um, than whether or not uh, a few caribou might not like a pipeline that we build. And in fact, usually the caribou end up loving the pipeline. You know, they end up hanging around because it's warmer. It's been the, it's been our previous. No, it's really true. It's really true. I mean, I, you know, I don't mean to trash on your beliefs because you may believe those things, but I, I think that, that, you know, I mean, what we found is that a lot of the pipelines that were, they were claiming it was going to kill the caribou and stuff, but it's like the caribou love the damn things because it keeps them warm in the wintertime. Nice. You know? So, yeah. So we found, they found them like huddled around with <laughs> these different things. So it's just, we, we've just got to be smart about the way we do things. And, and in, you know, back in the sixties, we were pretty dumb. Um, about things. We didn't care about stuff. And, you know, should we be dumping raw sewage into the rivers? Probably not a real good idea. 
Yeah. What's your take on chemtrails? Mm, interesting. You know, I for uh, I can't tell you really this, but go ahead. Go ahead. For the show, for the show that I'm doing, that uncovering aliens, we actually interviewed a a, a weather guy uh, for an episode, and he said, "Hey, I can totally prove chemtrails are, are false." But my impression of, of contrails, what I always thought that I knew about contrails was that they extended behind an aircraft for maybe a few thousand feet at most, and then they would slowly evaporate. And he was adamant that, no, that that's not the case. But that's always what I thought. And quite frankly, as a kid, I never remember seeing horizon-to-horizon contrails from aircraft. You'd see a plane come, there'd be a contrail behind it, it would evaporate, you know, at some point, and it was all just just displaced moisture. Um, Now you see these things, and they're literally... Horizon to horizon, they turn sunny days into cloudy days, and it definitely appears to be some sort of seeding um, project. Although, again, I would have to sit down with this weather guy and really listen to his take on it. But I just, uh, um, you know, I, I've seen them myself, and I'm like, well, it doesn't look natural to me at all. It may turn out that they are natural, but at this point, I just didn't think that they were necessarily natural. And the other thing is I just, you know, I don't remember ever seeing these kinds of things when I was a kid, but maybe I wasn't looking for them. So um, I think it's kind of up in the air. But the thing to me that's really the killer is that if you look at um, the paper that Edward Teller wrote about how you could cloud seed the upper atmosphere using commercial jetliners and... If you did that, you could reflect back about 1% of the sun's energy and thereby cool the planet. Well, that paper was published in, I think, 1997. Basically, it was an outline for the chemtrail project, and then that's exactly when all these chemtrail reports started coming out. So, you know, to my mind, it's like, wow, as a conspiracy theorist, I have to say that's a little bit too much of a coincidence for my taste. Yeah, and honestly, I don't remember seeing those when I was growing up either, to be honest. I mean, I just don't remember them being like that. I do have a question for you from Joe Tones. He's asking if you wouldn't mind, um, let's see, he's asking me if I wouldn't mind asking you, um, how the water got to Earth or formed on Earth, and does he think it came from another body like an asteroid, meteorite, or a possible collision with another planetary body? Well, I don't, I don't know. That's one of the theories, that the water came from an, another planetary body that hit the Earth and or a comet hit the Earth and drenched us all in water. Mm-hmm. Um, I do not honestly know how the water got here there's water on neptune there's water on earth um i think there was once water on mars that's that's pretty well proven it's just entirely possible that water is kind of an abundant um an abundant element or an abundant aspect of planetary formation we really don't know so that's just just too far out there for me to really speculate on i really don't know how we got our water and i don't think anybody else does either but it's definitely good that we have it here because without it we wouldn't be we wouldn't be on the planet right and you don't think there's a chance of us running out of water here do you uh no (laughs) okay (laughs) <laughs> yeah. I know well, they're I, trying to hoard it. it. Seems like they're trying to, you know, monopolize well, all the supply. Definitely, there's definitely corporate entities. I think at the behest of governments trying to get control over the fresh water supply. I mean, right now in in Oregon, if you put out, um, you know, a big bucket to collect rainwater, you're committing a crime now. Mm. And I think that is that is again, that's a very disturbing, tyrannical trend that I think our government. Um, and especially, especially accelerated in the last four or five years, has been trending in this direction. And it's, that's something that I really think we have to be very cognizant of and resistant to mm-hmm. and fight back about. Because, I mean, my, good God, seriously, it's, it's illegal to collect your own water, you know? I mean, mm-hmm. my response to that is two words, the first word of which begins with F, and the second word <laughs> begins with Y. So All you right. can two words, <laughs> seven letters to figure it out. I agree with that, too. And I think, isn't that one of the biggest problems we do have on Earth, though, insofar as just control and manipulation factors? It's like 1984 yeah. almost, huh? Yeah, well, yeah, we're not too far from that. And there are people who argue that 1984 was not a cautionary tale. It was a blueprint. So, mm-hmm. you know, that's, yeah. uh, that's, I think that's the box. biggest thing we need to turn around right now. Is, is my um, That's my take on it, anyway. Mm-hmm. It's more mm-hmm. liberation and so far as just not getting controlled and manipulated by this. Yeah. I agree with you. And, and, and when stupid laws like that are passed, then we need to get together and vote people out of office and, and reverse those laws or, or have, you know, it astonishes me that you can pass 
initiatives, and then some judge thinks that he has the authority to come and overturn it. Now, whatever you might think of, let's say, gay marriage, there was a proposition in California, Proposition 8, that um, where the voters of California voted to amend their constitution to exclude gay marriage. And then some federal judge comes along and says that he's overturning that. Well, you, a, a judge cannot overturn an amendment to the Constitution. In other words, an amendment, let's say, to the United States Constitution, it's not subject to judicial review. It can't be reviewed by the courts. It's an amendment to the Constitution. It is law the moment that it's passed. But we've gotten into this thing now where, where I think we're just kind of like, We've got this completely distorted and failure of understanding of how our government structure is supposed to work. We're, this is a republic. It is not a democracy. Uh-huh. In a democracy, you have no rights but those which descend from government. In a republic, you have all rights which descend from God. And we've, I think, partially due to the failure of our education system in the last 20, 30, 40 years, have reached a point where nobody really understands um, these things anymore. You know, nobody really understands that, that a, a judge can issue any order he wants, but nobody has to follow that order. There's nothing that says that the there's nothing that says the Supreme Court is the final authority on anything in the Constitution. It does not say that. So it's just kind of like, you know, there's supposed to be a system of checks and balances, and right now things are very unbalanced. I agree with that big time. Yeah, I'd like to see that turn around. But we're off well, yeah. the subject of Mars, but hey. Yeah, really. I'll be, I'll be heading to Mars pretty soon if it gets any worse with that. <laughs> I was going to ask you, uh, let's, we're going to get ready to uh, wrap this up pretty soon, but let's, let's run down, uh, what, what you're doing, what your projects are, are doing and, uh, and your books and where people can get a hold of your, your research, and your website okay. and all that stuff. Well, I have, uh, my, my blog is mikebarra.blogspot.com and that's with one R. It's B-A-R-A. So mikebarra.blogspot.com. You've got articles there. I just did a two-part article on the Kennedy assassination and extracted some stuff from Dark Mission, my first book, um, that I authored with Richard C. Hoagland and talked about and updated that and put some new information in about the Kennedy assassination and what may have been the motivation behind that. Um, I've got the books can be obtained through the, that website. Or you can go to Amazon.com, type in my name, Mike Bear. I've got the four books to come up, Dark Mission, The Choice, Ancient Aliens on the Moon, and Ancient Aliens on Mars. And uh, you can pick up any one of them there. And uh, I've got some about the TV show coming out, the uh, uh, Uncovering Aliens show on Animal Planet, which will debut on December 17th. On December, the weekend of the 6th, and the, is it the 6th and 7th? Yeah, December the 7th. I'm speaking at the Phoenix MUFON meeting, so MUFON Phoenix, I'll be there to talk to them. I'm doing the Conscious Life Expo in February, the first weekend, weekend in February, which I also think is 7th and the 8th of February. I'll be in Los Angeles at the Conscious Life Expo. I'll be doing a big workshop there, showing you all the pictures and explaining to you what all this stuff, artificial stuff is on Mars and hopefully where it came from. And... Um, you can always catch me on uh, Ancient Aliens. I'm doing some new um, episodes for them this year. And, in fact, I'm doing uh, a new interview in about a week. I'm heading to L.A. again to uh, do some interviews there for them for Season 6 of Ancient Aliens. So that's awesome. kind of what's going on. That's wonderful. Yeah, you're a busy man, aren't you? I try to be, yeah. Well, that's great. Supportive. Oh, I love your work. It's fabulous. Thank you. I, I really hope everybody picks up a copy of all your work and, and your books. Uh, you're just a wellspring of information. I, I hope to have you back, too, and talk more about other things. I mean, there's so much to discuss, and I feel like we just sure. didn't have a, uh, much time to talk about a lot of things. But I was going to ask you, I, I think you mentioned something about the dark patterns on Mars. Is that is that connected to the possible canals that were discovered? Yeah, I think that the, what's, there's a thing called the wave of darkening, which is that in the summertime, the, the, the carbon dioxide caps, ice caps, recede, and the planet seems to get darker, and it seems to spread from the poles towards the equator. And with the early primitive telescopes, when this was going on, I think Schiaparelli and Lowell and some of these people looked at their telescopes, and they saw these dark patterns and this is where the, the idea of the canals came from. But what I think is really happening, and I cover this in Ancient Aliens on Mars, is that you've got plant life, simple primitive plant life like lichens that grow on, on you know, moss that grows on rocks here on Earth that come to life when, when the planet warms up, 
some moisture is released into the atmosphere, and the planet, just a little bit, comes back to life. And that's what this wave of darkening is. And in fact, I've got pictures in the book that show seasonal changes on rocks at the Viking 1 landing site. There's these rocks that have these blue-green patches on them, and they get very dark and very much bigger and prominent in the summer, and then they recede in the winter, and then they come back in the next summer, and they recede in the winter. Mm -hmm. So there's no question in my mind that there is simple, primitive plant life on Mars. I just think we got to help them out and, and put some more on there and get the planet, you know, brought back to life on a, on a permanent basis. I think it would be a great project for the human race to engage itself in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's really, really interesting. For sure. And so far as um, the the NASA whole moon landing scene, I mean, a lot of people, you know, it's, it's did we land? Did we not land? What, what's your take on that? Was it was it partially a hoax and partial landing? Uh, no, there are people that say that Stanley Kubrick filmed the whole thing in a studio in Area Fifty One or filmed some of it. But that's crackpot nonsense. Mm -hmm. Crap. That's he just doesn't. They just they're not understanding. The, the, diff, the uh, photography in a, in a vacuum, photography in the lunar environment. Um, I believe that we went, that, you know, all of the, the missions that landed did successfully land. I think there was no question that we were there to retrieve artifacts of the first time this previously advanced ancient civilization on Mars, or on the moon, rather. And, you know, that was definitely the purpose, and we absolutely went. And to me, the, the best argument is if we we're going to fake it, you know, why would you fake it nine times? We went to the moon nine times. We landed six times. We put 12 astronauts on the surface of the moon. Why would you fake it that many times? There's really no point in doing it. So um, to my mind, no, none of those things add up. And I did cover that in Ancient Aliens on the moon. And uh, it just, the whole fake moon landing stuff, there's just really no evidence in my mind to support that. It's a lot of people that are looking at the sea secrecy of the space program and saying to themselves, well, they must have been faking the whole thing, when in fact, what the secrecy was all about, what they were really doing, is covering up what the real mission was, what the real objectives were, and what they were really doing. And I think that's the answer to what the secrecy is. It's, it's kind of like the fake conspiracy to cover up the real conspiracy, which was to go to the moon and retrieve this proof of the gods, the Anunnaki, whoever it was, that had been here before. I think that's really what you're looking at. Mm -hmm. That makes perfect sense. Wow. It's been incredible to have you on tonight, Mike. I'm so appreciative, and I know the audience is appreciative of having you on, too. So thank you very much for being here tonight, and we're getting ready to wrap this up. But I hope to have you back in the future for sure. So please stay in touch with me and, and let me know when your next book comes out. We will do that for sure, sure Solaris, and I yeah. really appreciate it. Oh, yeah, thank it's you. awesome. And I um, just want to thank everybody again for tuning in tonight and everybody at Revolution Radio chat room. A um, lot of good questions, so thanks for uh, texting those in, listeners and producers. And stay tuned for Shiny Side Out with David Dunger and Mecky coming up next, of course, to sail you into the night from down under. And next week, be sure to tune in. My special guest will be Robin Andrews, and she'll be discussing alien contactees. So that will be something else that we will be covering. So anyways, we have just a few minutes left. Is there anything in particular you want to mention, Mike? Is he there? Yeah, I'm here. No, there's <laughs> no nothing really extra. Uh, I had muted you out. Um, no, nothing really new. Nothing beyond that. Just that, you know, you can pick up my books in the bookstores. You can find them at Amazon.com. And I would appreciate everybody going out and getting a copy because I would really like to buy a Porsche. So, I, you know, I mean, you know, look, I do live in it. We, we, do we not live in a material universe? We may be spiritual beings, but we all live in a material universe. And let's face it, it's more fun to live in a material universe with precision German engineering. So, yes, it's nice um, to have toys, isn't it? <laughs> it's, it is. That's really not what I'm going to do. Well, it might be what I do with the money. But, um, no, I, you know, I think that we all have to just stay awake and alert and keep feeding your brains with this information because the, the truth, the reality of, uh, of this existence is a lot different than what you hear on the news and see on TV. It's just, it's a very different universe that we live in and it, there, it's full of, of mystery and intrigue and contrary to what the scientists, the scientific materialists will tell you, we know almost nothing about it. We know almost nothing about cosmology. We know very little about human evolutions. There's all kinds of fascinating stuff to go dig into and don't let anybody dissuade you from that quest because that's the most important thing you'll do in your lifetime. <laughs>
That's so well said. Yeah, there's so many veils to information, I swear, so many levels. And then there's the disinformation and, and all this other stuff that people get hit with. So it's really hard to use. Uh, basically, they need to use discernment when they're when they're looking through data because there's just so much of it. And the, you're right about that moon landing thing. That makes perfect sense, by the way. Yeah, well, thank you. I, I thought it out pretty well. Because I, 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 well, you know, I, I get hit with so much information, and I swear it's just after a while, you just want to take a step back and just look at it from a different perspective and a parallax view. But that makes perfect sense. I was going to ask you real quick before we lose some time here. Did you ever read Velikovsky's Worlds in Collision? I have not read Worlds in Collision. I do know a lot about it. I know a lot about Velikovsky. I've always wanted to include Velikovsky in a book that I've written, but I've never found the right place to stick him. So, oh, okay. so I think that's coming in a future book. I have a whole 5,000 words about Velikovsky that I'm going to put into a book at some point. Okay, excellent. Well, thank you very much, Michael. Everybody have a great weekend, and I'll see you next week.